Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, fellow entrepreneurs, Alhamdulillah. I'm, I'm grateful to be here today to share my story. Uh, my name is Usainu Dambel. I run a business called DBC. But it started generations before me. Uh, my dad, whenever I introduce myself to uh, people around, when I use the name Usainu Dambel, and they'll tell me, well, that name rings a bell. My dad has started from a very humble beginning. He came from Boraba, a village, and um, he came down to the city to make a life for himself. He was in photography. He used the lens to capture very memorable event, uh, uh, moments of Gambia and sold it worldwide. He was someone who circulated hundreds of thousands of postcards worldwide. And before him, his father was a hunter. And his dad used the same technique, the gun, to fend for himself and his family to bring food home. My dad used the camera so he could capture that image and all of that sort. He taught me a whole lot of things. When we were young growing up, I remember going to school. In high school, the amount of money I took as lunch money was two dollars, when most of my friends were taking probably 20 dollars or more. Um, two dollars, yes. Literally, that was the peanut, uh, peanut money, meaning I'll buy granites, ice, and that's what I would leave by. What he did at that tender age for me is to understand how one can live with the minimum resources that you are gifted with and make the best out of it. My dad had multiple shops around town. I remember growing up, uh, we would count and package all the postcards that he printed. And uh, we would go to those shops and sell. And because of good service, the way you treat people and all of that stuff, people will give you a little bit of money of tips. So now, I'm taking $2 to school. My friends got more than I have. What is that going to do to me? Is it going to break me? Or is it going to provoke some, some uh, spirit in me to work even harder to achieve more? So when we go to the shops, this is what we do. We work hard, and that was on weekends. And I earned some money for the weekday. And believe me, when we started earning, probably I was earning more than the principal those times. So that in itself gave me the courage, the momentum, the drive. I know I had to do something special in my life. Uh, fast forward. 94, my journey into entrepreneurship started. Be careful what you wish for. I remember those days, uh, my dad had some issues with the then government. And for some reason, as a young guy, I wasn't comfortable with him being around and so on. I told him, Pa, he said, yes, son. I told him, you can leave. You can live with the whole family if you want. I'll be here, I'll take care of business. And he looked at me and he smiled. He reminded me these same words that I'm saying right now some few years ago. And actually that did happen. My dad traveled to UK to do some transactions that he had with um, government. He traveled. And we had, we, I had to continue the struggle. It wasn't easy. But just before he did travel, like every one of us, every young guy at that time, we all wanted to leave Gambia. The last exam paper you would do at high school, you wanted to be out. Whatever the reason was, out. And um, my dad told me at that time, I needed a year with him to graduate from his university, his words. 
And it's a university that will teach you what they do not teach in the confinement of a classroom. It will teach you survival skills. It will teach you to appreciate life. It will teach you to make something out of nothing. It will teach you to be resilient. But little did I know that being an entrepreneur, especially in the Gambia around that time, was more, more like being a boxer. Yes, it's easy to throw punches, but to receive punches, that is where the challenge is. Blackout punch from Nawek, <laughs> uppercuts from, you know, GRA. So you, we had them all. We had all the problems, but you had to stay strong. You had to believe in the course. You had to start small. Starting small for me, I had to choose something that would connect me to every one of you. And I have dealt with a lot of people. This is probably our 28th year that we have been doing business transactions. I chose business cards and ID cards for a simple reason. I wanted to have a database. I wanted to have a database of everybody that was around me, and I wanted to know what they did, and what they could do, and what their dreams and aspirations were. So I took business cards. So within a year or so, probably I did business cards for everybody. I did ID cards, and I just want to say uh, a big thank you to TAF. Because the early days, I remember when I walked up to his office and I wanted to do their IDs. Actually, at that time, he has already given the IDs to another company. But when I introduced myself, Dumbbell, that name that rings a bell, he connected with my dad. And I think a lot of people were sympathetic at that moment. And he offered me the contract to do their IDs. And it wasn't, uh, I think it was the last uh, session we had. I met up with Taf after uh, close to two decades. He gave me that same ID card that I did for him. And that one for me uh, sparked a lot of, uh, 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 it sparked something in me to appreciate Taf for the good that he has done for Gambia and Gambians. And it's not only about him. Because for all of us can see right now, the amount of money that he has spent for hosting this event and he wants to do every year, it's a whole lot of money. And for someone to part with that has to be someone who's very generous. <laughs> so um, yes, the business started from the bedroom, you know, from the bedroom to the corridor, the corridor to um, uh, a small shop, you know, from a small shop, uh, we grew the business. And today we are proud to say for the 20 years, we have, uh, just like my dad was a household name in photography, a lot of the older folks would know, I think um, we have become a household name in print as well. And today, um, there are a lot of people, young people, who have also taken the, um, uh, the print industry. Because like I say, always, I don't want us to focus on strong individuals. It's nice when, when, when you are the, the um, beneficiary at that point. But it, it's even more beautiful when it's an industry. We need to be the players in the industry. We don't want people who are just individuals in a bigger industry. And I'll give examples. Um, we are proud to say, I saw um, Uncle Aki Allen. They've done fantastic, 40 years or so in um, providing electrical appliances and all of those stuff. But it pains me when I see that the industry as a whole it's been controlled by people who are not really one of us. They are invited, but we want to take ownership. And I'm going to take it from um, Mr. Carroll, who said, we cannot be too polite all the time. So I'm going to say this. It has to be for us, by us, by force. <laughs> Not in arrogance or anything, but when we were kids growing up, by the time you used Damakwa Def by force, it means that 
there will be no excuses. We have to stop making excuses for ourselves now and start moving on. In my journey, as we try to build uh, this uh, business of ours, I've met a lot of people. And I have two stories I would want to share with you. There was this young guy, he came, I think he was doing the tiling at our office at that time. And he looked at me and said, how did you do it? You're building this stuff? You guys own this and all of that stuff? Is it, you know? And I said, um, yes, we're trying. And he said, there is no hope for me. I said, why? When he looks around, he sees poverty all around him. His father is poor, his grandfather is poor, his great-grandfather is poor, his uncle, everybody around him is poor, as he deems. But I told him, now, that question or that statement that young guy made, for me, I believe it was probably God sent. What am I going to tell this young guy that is going to change his life, that is going to make him hopeful? Then I told him, do you know Taff? And he said, yes, Taff. You know, that white guy who's doing that, those houses and all of that stuff. I'm like, no. Taff is one of us. Taff is very Gambian like you and I are. Actually, Taff, he is the messenger in chief. He's one of Gambia's finest. If he can do it, and he's using what you are doing right now, we have to believe in the little that we do. We have to appreciate that that little can appreciate in value. We have to uh, uh, nurture the little steps because those are the ones that are going to be giant steps. And that kid that day had the belief that one day he can also be a tough. That's one story. The other one I would love to share I know this lady, actually she's very close to uh, my family, and she sells peanut butter at the market. Probably she's done that for three decades. And um, for some reason, someday, um, they were blessed with some cash. So like everybody would do, they would approach uh, us in business, either for advice or to facilitate travel. So she came by and told me that her daughter wanted to leave town, but she has done everything and she couldn't go. And what advice would I give? I looked at the lady, I had to be honest. And I told the lady, I think your daughter should sell dege like you do, peanut butter. And the lady, I think I could see the disappointment in her. And she told me outright, I don't want my daughter to sell dagger like I did. But again, like I said, how we should appreciate the little things that we do, because those are the things that grow. She did accept that. But now, looking, looking forward, I am saying this is a lady who's got 30 years experience in what she does. And most of the times, as Gambians, what do we do? We always leave our strength behind. Mentor, we talk about. I see people going out trying to get mentor from outside. Actually, it starts from the home. It starts within. We have to appreciate what our parents do. If they were security guards, yes, let's aim at some point. You know what? I'm going to run a business bigger than G4S. We have to have that kind of inspiration in us. So, um, yes, uh, the lady couldn't travel. The money was used for whatever other reason. And now the dagger business is still stagnant. And I will tell you for free, peanut butter, dagger, could be a multi-million dollar, if not a dollar business in Gambia. We all consume it, but we look down upon it. So what I would like to share with you and myself is to have continuity in what we do. Let's not let schoolwork so-called academic, to kind of interfere with the general education. Because for me, education is broader than just going to school. And most of the time, schoolwork or universities, that kind of thing, 
kind of limits us because we feel comfortable that we have achieved already. And whenever we feel we have achieved, that's the beginning of your decline. Today, alhamdulillah, I'm very proud, just to uh, uh, close. My wife, Mami, has worked um, with Deloitte, with TAF, for 10 years. And she decided she wanted to spend time with the family and kids. And after 10 years, she decided to join my business. She's a chartered accountant. She's my boss. I cannot even afford to pay her. <laughs> but she came in. And she's taking half of the salary. But the beauty is, together, we are building a very strong family unit. I am giving my kids what my dad gave to me. And that's what made me sit here in front of you today to be able to share with you. I've never been to university or any of that sort. Everything that I've earned and learned I've got everything from her, from my parents and stuff. We need to continue. And my wife has showed me that spending, now, now she came in, she thought DBC was going to be part-time. But print is not part-time. She <laughs> realized later that it was more than a full-time job. But she came, she helped with the systems. I do what I do best. I'm more of a creative guy and getting the job done. She did the administrations and all of that stuff. We've got a very good team that helps with uh, growing the business as well. Very loyal. But now, way forward, I want my kids. They're right here in front of, uh, uh, behind you guys. I told them to come to see what's happening now. How my great-grandfather fent for his family when he was a hunter how my dad took the camera, educated us, and put us in this position, and how I want them to be even better than all of us. They're sitting at the back. I thank them all, and I love them very much. My mom has been outstanding as well. Of course, I have to talk about her. Yeah. She gave us all the love, the hope, everything that we need to grow. And this is what, like striving for excellence, this is what it is. It starts from the family unit, and we grow it. The, the, the mentors, everybody is within you, is around you. Pick the best things that you can get from people around you and grow it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Zulu. That's uh, such an inspiring uh, story. And uh, I think he's highlighted the importance of continuity. I think Dr. Fahl talked about that yesterday. But now we have an example of a Gambian that has taken over the business from his dad and taken it to the next level and uh, training his young family to take it to even bigger level. I think we should uh, applaud him for that. Thank you. He also mentioned how his father's name opened doors for him. And I would like to share that with the youth. A good name is better than silver and gold. Always remember that. Don't try shortcuts or try to get rich too fast. Of course, be ambitious, but remember, you need to pass down the good name your father has given you and your mother, you need to pass it to the next generation. And that only depends on what you have done. So that brings me to the next speaker, Useinu. If you can take us through uh, your subject matter. I was given the, the topic of good entrepreneurship as the first point and um, ethics and behavioral change as my second topic. Now, I will be spending more time on ethics and behavioral change, but let me address uh, good entrepreneurship. And um, of course, all of you know there's a lot of material, there's a lot of text about good entrepreneurship, 
But again, as I said, I wanted to situate it in a context. So I decided to talk about good entrepreneurship, situating it in the tough context. And I took four issues that I wanted to talk about. The first one is maximizing your resources, which I think we all know. Tough has been doing quite well. Diversifying, being nimble, being able to change. When the environment was challenging here, he was able to immediately shift, move to Nigeria, and continue doing what he was doing. Now, leveraging your networks. That is why we're here. I'm sure all of you will agree that TAF has brought a significant amount of diversity together, where we've all been able to learn and exchange. And that is critical. And that, that's family, that's friends, that's networks, and all the people that you interact with, to be able to pull them together to foster learning, which is the next point. Fostering learning in a context where we're all able to exchange and understand things that we didn't understand well, things that we didn't know. And the last bit is a viable product, a viable business proposition. And that's what was being talked about the other day around sustainability, continuity. And you know, that he has done in a brilliant way. And I want to thank him and his broader team for the level of organization, the seamless transitioning from one to the other, and what we are seeing happening here. That, to me, is what good entrepreneurship is all about. Now, the second point around ethics and um, behavioral change is really a point that I want to address. And I, I'm not ashamed to say that I've had two sleepless nights doing some research, not being someone who lives in this context and works here. And the reason I did that, I'll tell you. I was having a conversation the other day, and someone said to me, you know, treasury bill rates have come down to 4%. And I said, really? He said, yes. And am I one of those people who always thought the best way to derive value in the Gambia is just invest in T-bills and organize exchange rate movements? And you're fine. But the, quest, the fall is fundamental. Why is there a fall in treasury bill rates? It's like you have a bottomless um, pit, and money seeps through it. And all of a sudden, you seal it. The money doesn't seep anymore. So government stop borrowing. And all of us, those of us who've been following the commissions will admit that government borrowed for the central bank to buy dollars for it to leak. And interest rates went up. And they ended up at 38%, to, you know, 28%. All of a sudden, that stopped. And interest rates collapsed. But now, that presents an opportunity for transformational change. What does that mean? It means the banks will now be forced to look for performing assets. Where are those performing assets going to come from? From those of us in this room. So we don't need government necessarily to make this country move. What we need are ideas, creativity, innovation. And I was quite pleased to listen to the core group of young people who were here. And Mr. Nyai, I want to associate myself with the term you used around a social council. I think this is fundamental if we're going to see transformational change. The whole process of social development, the setting of the social development goals, has been a push for equal partnership. It has been a push for leveraging domestic resources. And that is language that should resonate with us. Here is an opportunity for us to leverage domestic resources. And it's in two forms. The biggest saver in this country that we have is the Social Security and Housing Finance Corporation. So one of the big tasks your social council has is to push for liberalizing the pension market, to release liquidity into the market, to release liquidity into the market for ideas to generate money and generate resources. It is not generating resources just trying to build cheap houses and buying treasury bills. And that comfort zone is gone. It's gone for banks, it's gone for the social security and housing, and it's gone for the public enterprises that we have. They are going to have to come to the market and compete like the rest of us to try and generate revenue. Now, we must not leave it to them. We must dictate the terms in which that is done. And that is to push the banks to come to the market and look for assets that perform. Now, for those assets to perform, I think um, I saw the Chamber of Commerce here. It is their job to foster a culture of businesses being set up and governed properly. Very often, I hear young kids come to me and say, I need a business plan. Why do you only need a business plan if you want to go and borrow? It should not be like that. It should be part of your organizational culture to be structured in such a way that you can respond in any circumstance. Whether it is borrowing, whether it is an 
you know, initiative that comes your way, you should be able to react and go there and be part of the game. And that, for me, is what I think we need to focus on and really create an environment where there is seriousness, there is accountability, there is good ethics in management. There are a lot of opportunities. If you take the Gambia, for example, for, take the um, African Development Bank High Fives. It's about, you know, feeding Africa. It's about um, lighting up Africa. It's about transforming Africa. It's about integrating Africa. It's about improving the quality of life of Africans. It's a lot of opportunity. Energy generation in Gambia is all fossil fuels. We can leap a generation and transform into renewables. And we must not think, we, must, we mustn't think that it is government who should do that. We must be bold and pick up ideas that demand a lot of capital. The capital is available. Some of us are stunned by the amounts of money that have been leaking from our system. And it's all domestic resources. Now, the reverse of this problem is that the Gambia Revenue Authority are going to wake up very soon to the fact that banks are not going to make huge profits to pay taxes. So they themselves will have to come to the party. So Mr. Dambele, you don't have to worry. They will come to the party to help us generate resources that they can tax. Because if the banks don't have an avenue to generate resources, it's you and I who are going to be the productive sector that you need to tax. Now, you cannot tax me if I don't produce. I will not produce if I don't have an incentive. So I think this is the moment for transformational change in Gambia. And I think it will happen if we, all of us engage. And I would have loved Rene to be in the room, because my view about leadership is that leaders emerge. You don't find leaders. They emerge. And there's a classic example on the hashtag Gambia has decided. Where did it come from? It just emerged. Because there was a circumstance that necessitated something to say, we voted, we want you to leave. And everybody associated themselves with that. Whether you spoke English or you didn't, you recognized what it meant. It meant I walked, woke up in the morning, went in, cast my vote, because I wanted you to leave. <laughs> so you need to leave. And, and, and in, in the world where I work, that is called civic agency. And we all have it. We all exercise our civic agency in different forms, in different fora, at different times, in different ways. What we must do is not to build a cult mindset. And this is the mistake that, in my view, this country made. We allowed the development of a cult, and even worse, a cult in one person, who, in my view, really did not merit it. I was telling a friend yesterday, when the president um, asked to greet us, Everybody got confused. I mean, they didn't know what to do. I remember the guy saying to me, no, 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 don't come to the stage, go down. <laughs> you know, and the president said, no, 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 I want to greet them. If I want to greet someone, I don't want to lean over. I mean, I need to be in. So it, it's, about, it's, about it's about interrogating the question of humanity. We are all individuals. The president is an individual, just like all of us. He has feelings, he has needs. Now, let us not create another person. Because that is where our problem lies. Let us, let, us, let us see him as who he is. And I was quite pleased that everybody here addressed him as Mr. Adam Abaro. That is important. Because that means he is like me, he is like you. By virtue of fortune and trajectory, he's the head of state. We need to respect that. He heads our nation. But beyond that, we are the ones who can move this nation. That's why we have our voting cards. That's why we vote. That's what citizenship is all about. That's why I believe transformational change will come from citizens who are engaged, who understand the need to have a nation functioning. Now, let me come back to my point about this dramatic collapse in interest rates. I don't think it is being discussed. And allow me to say that I don't think it's as a result of government policy. It's not. It's by default. They don't need to borrow. All of a sudden, all this liquidity is available. The banks haven't told you yet, but they're thinking about what are we going to do? We have our staff to pay. We have the cost of our infrastructure, all these things we're doing. So that is a moment for those of us who run businesses, who are thinking, but we need to think big. I mean, I, I like your term, yeah. You want to own a block. 
That's what it's about. That's what it's about. We are, we are, we are the ones who are going to bring the change. Because it is for us that it has meaning. We live here. This is our history. This is our heritage. And we must stop thinking that foreign direct investment should mean that we are subordinate and we are peripheral. <laughs> we are not. It means, I mean, in my view, it's an ideas game. If I have an idea, I need to ensure it's a big idea. And uh, let me, let me, let me, let me ha show how that is manifesting in our banking system. I don't know how many of you know. We all deposit our money to the, in the banks. But the advance to deposit ratio in this country, let me break it down. The amount of money banks lend is 20% of what we deposit. I mean, that is pathetic. It, it's disgraceful in my view. And we need to confront that. That's point number one. Second point is, 60% of who they lend to is people who do petty trades. They do not lend to any big ideas. And in the past, they didn't need to. Because somebody was paying them 28%, 18%, 19% in their T-bills. So the banks were in heaven. I mean, I would happily be a banking MD. There is no idea. You don't need to create. But now the game has changed. If you are not creative, don't be surprised. A few banks will fold. I have no doubt in my mind. They will not be able to exist in this market. It's a new market. And, and, really, and really, that is what I want to invite in all of us. The second part is, and I, I really want to compliment my older brother here, Taf, because I was quite uh, pleased yesterday when he talked about an eco-friendly building. You know, renewables, sustainable development. That's what we are talking about in this new era. You know, sustainable living, sustainable consumption. I mean, now people are attacking food waste as a problem in our global space. So for him, as an industrial leader, to talk about an eco-friendly building already suggests that the ethics that we're talking about, around, and I want to stay on subject on this one, the ethics we're talking about is about relating to a new world, but still in a big way. It doesn't have to be in a small way. There's climate change and adaptation for those of you in agriculture, Momar and the others. You need to look at what's happening in the bigger world. How are people transforming products? How are people producing more? You know, Israel, we all know, a very small country. They brought us point-to-point -point irrigation. Under stress for water, they pushed the bar very high and came up with a solution. We can do that. Now, I know all of us um, treat anecdotally the notion of a Singapore or a Dubai. But if you take Dubai, for example, we all think Dubai is being driven by oil. Dubai is not being driven by oil. Dubai is being driven by ideas and ensuring that there is available capital at low cost. Now, us Gambia, by default, probably is the only good thing that Jame Going has done that's fundamental. By default, all of a sudden, we have T-bills falling to 4%. Your council now need to say to the banks, what's the justification for a 12% interest rate? What justifies it? There are no economic variables today that justify an interest rate more than 1% higher than the T-bill rate. And that's a conversation that we must have. And, and, and I am being selfish in this. I mean, I, I run my own business here, small. But I'm not leveraged for the minute. But I want to be leveraged because I want to grow. And I want to do big things. So that is really the point that I felt uh, I needed to digress on. Because I, I thought about giving you a PowerPoint presentation. But then I thought, no, 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 no. This context is a context that lends itself to transformational behavior, transformational thinking, and with it, transformational change. And what is even more encouraging is that I listen to all uh, four or five young, Nyai doesn't want to be young, but still, I, I admire what you're doing, and I admire what you've done. I was joking with Draman that for the past few days, I have been telling my sister and the Aisha too, that I'm working on a feed where I can do a summary recording of what's going on here and send it to Jame's feed so that he sees <laughs> what, what this nation was missing. We were missing I a lot. Uh, you know, so that, that needs to show. Now, I, I, I wanted to end on a final note to, to really compliment Taf in two dimensions. I mean, most of you may not know where the word Taf comes from. You might think it's his name. 
but it's not. I remember very clearly when TAF was exiting SSCC construction to start TAF construction. Working, we used to share a compound. I was in the apartment ahead of him. He was, and he was walking out, and he turned around and said to me, Oh, buy now SSCC, why be TAF TAFLA? Company is going to. <laughs> The com this company is going to be called Tough Tough. And I still remember the first promotion material he had was a cup in which he wrote Tough Tough. And now he's lost the one tough and really grown into something that we need, we need to not only admire, but we need to treat as a basis for learning. Because what Tafa does, and I know this for a fact, because I am one of those people who, when I left, wasn't very well connected with this country. But people like Tafa made sure I remained connected. He always challenged me and he always confronted me that, look, the ideas game is in Gambia. We may have been inconvenienced for a while, but the ideas game is here, the arena is here. And Taf, let me say, I will join you very soon. That's my intention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Useino. I mean, you see how talented uh, Gambians are. And I think whatever we say of, of Jame, <laughs> we have to thank him. <laughs> because he pushed us to realize our potential. potential. I mean, you go to anywhere in the world, you'll find a Gambian at the highest level. If Jame wasn't around, we would have still been here. Probably I was going to retire as managing director of ports in two weeks' time because I'll be 55 <laughs> years. But it's forced most of us to go out and acquire the skills and then dare to think big, like Papa now wants an oil well. Mm. So I'll join him. <laughs> so Usain, you talked about developing networks. I think that's very important. I mean, your networks are as valuable as your fixed assets. They also open, open doors for you. Learning and development. Never underestimate uh, training uh, your staff and yourself. Uh, you need to have a viable product. I mean, that's the sine qua non. People need to uh, want what you buy. And he said, we don't need government to move forward. In fact, we should ask government to get out of the way. You know, facilitate things, provide security, provide even education, I think the private sector can, can do. But who is government? We are the government. So let's tell them, the ones that we've entrusted, what we want. He also mentioned about liberalizing pension funds. I think that's going to happen sooner rather than later. And he said that bankers now would now behave as bankers, as real bankers, <laughs> and not rent seekers, because the opportunity has disappeared. So they need to lend to the real economy. And lastly, we shouldn't create another dictator. Yep. I don't think that's going to happen. Ah, because it's... President Barrow went to Maka. He is entitled to be called Alaji. But Gambians are so much afraid that after Alaji, he may be called... <laughs> professor. <laughs> call <him> professor. <laughs> they are so afraid that after Alaji, he may be called doctor. They say, uh-uh. <laughs> Even the Alaji don't take it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, he did not take the allergy. He accepted to be called President Adam Abaro, and we thank him for that. But there's no way we're going to get another dictator. The last one will remain in Equatorial Guinea. <laughs> I would now like to call on Tuma to deliver on the final subject matter. Thank you very much. Alpha, but I think you introduced me as your in-law, but I prefer the sister, because I think that was first. I, I and think <laughs> yes. um, thank, I also would like to thank everybody, most especially Taf, 
for having given me this opportunity, especially on my most favorite topic, which includes the youth. I'm passionate about youth issues, and I would like to tell the youth, most of all, the definition of youth empowerment. I think you need to know, you, will, you might just say youth empowerment by word, but you might not know what it means. Empowerment is a big word, and you must respect it when we say you need to be empowered, because that is what you need to be given. You need to be empowered. And to, to tell you, youth empowerment is the outcome by which you, the youths, as change agents, gain the skills to impact your own lives and the lives of other individuals, organizations, and your communities especially. It is very important, therefore, for you to be empowered because you are the future of the next generation. And when is the next generation? It is now. Because I don't believe in tomorrow. I believe in today. Because like some of the speakers said, leaders make leaders. And if you follow the leaders, then you are leaders. If you follow good leaders, that is. And I believe we need good leaders today to make you leaders of tomorrow. So you are leaders as well, the youths. Our leaders should therefore be held accountable, which is my topic today, to ensure that there are skill development for you. What are skill developments? These are the ways of strengthening the skills of you, the youth, so that you will know how to effectively make decisions, to positively interact with your own peers, as well as act in your own communities as advocates for your own benefits. Because nobody can advocate more than you can advocate for yourself. I wouldn't want to give my voice to someone else to speak for me, because they might just say it in words, but you will say it with word, with passion, with perseverance, and then you will be believed because it is coming from you. So I would want you to be trained to be able to speak for yourself. And also, critical awareness is very important. We, mu we must put our government at task to make us more critically aware. And in this process of providing us or you, they need to give you the information and the right resources for necessary analyzing the issues that impact your lives. You know what you need in your life. You shouldn't let anybody, like somebody said, give you the resources. Go and grab them. If you see them anywhere, they are yours, as much as they are our leaders. They are there because of you. And, as, and most importantly, opportunities. We mustn't let opportunities slip by our fingers. You and I, we own this community. We own this country. So opportunities shouldn't just be given to the Adama Barros, to the sons and daughters of who and who's. No, I believe in opportunities to be equally given. I believe in equity. People say equality, but what is equality without equity? Equity is where we all start. We can be given the equal opportunity. They can say, I mean, school is free for everybody. But what is free school? If your parents cannot afford to get your uniform, that is where equal equity comes in. They must give people the same opportunity. You cannot win a race if you start from zero and someone else starts from one mile. Before you get to that one mile, they would have run three miles. So obviously you cannot win the race. And that is where equity comes in. I don't believe just in equality. I believe in equity as well. So I will go back to youth population. About 65% of the total population of Africa are below the age of 35 years. And over 35% of that 65 are between the ages of 15 and 35 years old. So it is a huge population. And the larger the population, the more resources need to be given to them, obviously. And that is what you should demand. You should demand for more. You can be called Oliver for asking for more. That doesn't make you hungry because it is deserving. It is what you deserve. And you should be given what you deserve. 
and that is more. And by 2020, it is projected that out of four people, three will be an average 20 year old. And about 10 million young people will arrive each year on the labor market. And that is only in Africa. I'm not counting our African population in the diaspora. If we were to count them, it would be more. So I think the more we are, the more we deserve, and the more we need to ask for. And that is how we should make them accountable by asking for more, by putting them on their tools to do more and give us more. The world population today stands at over 7.1 million. Uh, sorry, billion. We are 1.2 youths. That is the Western definition of youth, because for them, youth is between 15 and 25. Our definition is 35. And if we add, it, if we add up to 35 years, obviously it will go beyond 1.2 billion. And that is a huge number. And um, the same study revealed that in the next 15 years, the global economy would need to create over 600 million new jobs. I was glad when Reni mentioned that because job creation is very important and for whom? For the youths. Because like I said, every year on average we would see 10 million coming into the um, labor market. So they need to be considered. So failure thus to address youth issues will cripple any country's economic growth and obviously exacerbate the chronic unemployment and poverty. If we are not given opportunities, we wouldn't have anything to eat. And what do we do? We will die. We wouldn't just die in our countries. We will perish along the Atlantic, along the Mediterranean, like our youths are doing now. Libyan crisis is not new. It has been going on and on and on. Because we are being aware now, awareness is greater now. That is why we are saying the Libyan crisis, but it is not new. And we need to take our government accountable to make sure that it stops. How can we make them accountable? We cannot, we've had our president say that the diasporans are free to come home. They've always been free. But then what do they come home to? Somebody mentioned, do we come, well, that when he was coming home, they said, you are going to eat grass. Do we need to come back home to eat grass? No, we need to come back home to continue eating the cereal that we used to eat abroad. And how are we going to do that if we do not put our government accountable to make sure that they stop using our resources in driving large Pajeros with I mean, um, expensive fuel, <coughs> two or three cars parked at their homes, big mansions, high per diems. No, we need to put them accountable. Ask them, when they go abroad, what benefit are they going to bring to us? Our president said that he was tired. <laughs> he said he was exhausted after 22 hours of traveling from China. What did he bring us? We wanted to know. We don't care how tired you are. We gave us our votes. <laughs> we want to know what deal, what deal you, I mean, you made for us. To, give, to bring us more resources. That is my interest, not how tired you were. Obviously, you were on a first-class plane with, I mean, a fully reclined seat. You slept all the way. Excuse me, we don't need that. <laughs> so government must be held accountable for you and I, for my youth to go to better schools and after schools to be given I mean jobs. So they must be held account they must be held accountable. And like I always say, it all goes back to good governance. Government intervention. Government must I always say it. My, I am responsible for my youth because I am the government. When I took public office, I took the risk. And I said, I want to make things happen. I want to see the change. I want to see the Gambia that I grew up in. I grew up in Banjul, 
where everybody was everybody's child. I don't see that now. I see Dadinjai's child. I see Draman's child. No, that is not what I want to see. And like I said, it go all goes back to good governance. And who are the government? You are the government. If you lay sleeping, complacent, we will have another Jame coming to us. And that is why you have to hold your government accountable. What is good governance? A good governance entails a democratic, a democratic and corrupt shown free society and when I say democratic I mean in the sense that you the youth irrespective of age or social status should not be discriminated against in making decisions that affect you as far as political representation is concerned we have um, the mayoral elections coming in April but I don't see a, I'm not saying we are not democratic but then if you are not too young to vote you shouldn't be too young to run. Where should you say <laughs> that you have to be 31 to run for mayor? If you can be 21 to run for councillor. And the councillors, the deputy mayor, is going to be um, elect, nominated from the councillors. So obviously, if you are 21 to run for councillorship, you can run for mayorship. So I say, I would ask, are we g being governed in the most democratic way I would personally say no and I will want my youth to question that and make their leaders accountable for that as well I am open to be questioned and I like I always say I will not rest my case without addressing the African youth charter the youth you go and search what the African youth charter says it gives you all the powers it gives you all the powers to question your government it aims to strengthen and to reinforce and to consolidate efforts to empower young people through meaningful youth participation and equal partnership in driving africa's and your country's development agenda the document refers to the rights freedoms and duties of young people in africa and as i'm speaking to you um the last report was on march 15 42 members I mean, 42 members signed the charter, and out of that 42, only 38 ratified, and Gambia is inclusive. But ratifying doesn't mean anything. We have to domesticate that into our local laws. It means that if we, if we don't domesticate it, we cannot act on them. And I put the task on the youth to make sure they put their government a task accountable to make sure those treaties are ratified, not only ratified, but domesticated. Because once they are domesticated, the judicial bodies would have the right to make sure that we exercise. For instance, it would have to accord every youth the local standing to enforce the provisions of that charter. And that charter gives you the power, gives you the power to exercise your empowerment. And that way you can be more free. And like I said, how do you hold your leaders accountable? To ensure you participate in every election to elect your leaders because you choose who you want to lead you in elections for example you need to know what your leaders are up to if you vote for them and then go to sleep obviously they will also go to sleep and i'm also asking the youth the government cannot just say that this is the time to register voters every year hundreds of thousands come of age they turn 18 so does that mean that they wouldn't vote until the next registration process? You should say no. Put them at task. Every year, anybody who is 18 must be registered to be given their right to exercise their civil right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fatumata. Now you understand why I said that the vacancy for dictatorship is ended. <laughs> In terms of uh, youth empowerment, power is something that nobody gives you. You have to go and grab it for yourself. So if the youth sit down and think that the elders will give you power, no. You go and get it. And one way she Tuma has mentioned is your vote. 
make sure you are registered to vote and make sure you vote. Then you can hold your, then you will have the power to hold your leaders uh, accountable. I think without wasting much time, I'll just go to the question and answer session because I understand I'm standing between you and lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I will ask the gentleman who, is, who was behind Gambe has decided to ask the first question. That is Sally Utal. Um, thank you very much, um, Alpha. Um, I think uh, before I get into my question come statement, I would like to mention uh, something very special about Mustafa Njai. Mr. Taf, can you kindly get up? <laughs> With respect, I'm begging you. Um, I, we always have this joke um, about what is, who is a youth, as Tuma has said. Um, <laughs> I, I, in fact, we have this discussion that I am a youth man and he is a youth boy. <laughs> um, but on a more serious note, um, I would like to, I think, Gamma's decided was successful because of Gambians across the world, not any particular individual. But I would also single out Taf as someone who, was, uh, who played a huge role when we needed support. I think uh, in the spirit of celebrating the great sons of Gambia as Jaha did and so celebrated Manka, I would really like to tell Gambians that Taf was one of our biggest supporters, financially and morally. I would like everyone to give him a hand of applause. And at a personal level, when I went home on the 31st of December and I found the NIA at my house, yeah. and Taf was the one that actually hit me. He was the one that gave me sanctuary. And, were, and in fact, he himself had to leave the country because of me, because of the phone conversation we were having. <laughs> now, the change that Gambians brought about, um, epitomizing this hashtag, the youths were at the forefront of this change. For sure. The Gambian youths, in their numbers, came out and voted for change. When the then president decided or attempted to take our voice, the youths came behind, all hands on deck, to ensure that our voices will not be silenced. And that is Gambians decided. Fast forward, now we have, we have, we have changed the government. We have changed the president. And the, the discourse of a youth, it's, you know, it's always, we always talk about the youth and the youth. First of all, in a lot of the discourse, we need to understand that the youth is not a homogeneous group. It's a heterogeneous group. There are youths in Kantu, they're using Banjo, they're using Sarakunda. They all have different and divergent needs. But in my interactions with the youths, I realized something. Uh, with humility, I would say this. Yes, youth empowerment is critical. These are the majority of the stakeholders in our population. Therefore, they should be at the table to design the policies that affects the lives, that affects how resources are allocated. Now, if the youth are to participate in the political process or the economic process or socially, meaning they have to be empowered, how can the youth meaningfully participate and engage the state and all players and hold them accountable if we don't give them the capacity. This is one area I think we have to critically look at as a country. And that's why, and I throw it back to, to Manjai. How do we, to be able to engage, you must have the capacity and the experience and so many other things, the skills. And those skills don't, they don't come very easily. We have to understand that we lived 22 years in a dictatorship. Civil society was dead. Our youth were not really empowered. Now we need to unlearn those 22 years and how and, and learn how to now engage our government in democracy. I put that back to Vajay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will invite Professor 
Pat Otomi to ask a question. Oh, thank you so very much. What I wanted to do, so many things were said here that I thought I should reflect a little on the Nigerian experience around them. But to bring to the fore the challenge of change, I'm glad the point of change was just raised. Uh, I was trying to say yesterday that change is a very, very difficult thing for a simple reason. And, and that reason was given 500 years ago by a man called Machiavelli in this statement that I like to repeat, which is that nothing is more difficult to bring about than a new order of things. Because those who profit from the old order will do everything to prevent a new order from coming about. That's, that's not the most important part of this. It continues. And this is the part that I want everybody to pay attention to here. Those who could profit from the new order do not do enough to make it happen. Because man is incredulous in his nature, not wanting to try new things until he has witnessed experience of it. So most of us will profit from this new order. But we take a wait and see attitude. While those who want the old order to remain are fighting to keep it, we are watching them and this new order doesn't really come about. So everybody has to be part of the process and really push for that new order to really come about. But the two examples I want to give from Nigerian experience that I, th I think we should be, uh, I was very pleased to listen to uh, Osmani Dumbbell's uh, remarks and presentations. Fantastic but a little caveat and some warning. Um, when I teach entrepreneurship, as I do very often, I point to the fact that many people, the wealthiest people in the early days in Nigeria, for example, in the 40s and 50s, made their money from doing things like baking bread. And they made a lot of money, but they thought it was infradig. They didn't want their children to do infradig things. So their children became doctors, lawyers, and engineers, and very poor people. <laughs> <laughs> However, if you realize that you could bake bread from the 50th, 20th floor of a tower that hosts your headquarters that you built with factories all over the country baking the same bread, then you will have a different attitude. Now, the caveat that I want to add here is the point about college and whether one needs to do that. We live in a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. In this world, you need certain kinds of skills to keep up that change. And so that kid can keep baking bread, but along the line, guess the know-how and the know-why that can make him bake that bread from 1,000 locations and make lots of money. So we need to encourage the young people here, yes, to take on what they have talent in, what they have tradition in, but to grow themselves as they're doing it to be able to compete more effectively in those territories. And the other point that you made, which I thought was important uh, to deal with, sort of, is, you know, we need to take it by force. And I understand the context of the force. But that force needs to be put in proper context. You know, in 1973 and 75, Nigeria enacted the so-called Enterprises Promotions Decree, which was the indigenization decree that forced foreigners to sell certain businesses to Nigerians. Uh, 20 years later, we had to reverse all of that. And part of what that does is that if people find that they can take it by force, so to speak, easy, that you get rent-seeking behavior. These companies are sold to people who really can't run them, and then you have sent a signal to the world that this place is not safe for other people's monies, and investors stop coming. It hurt Nigeria very, very badly. And even after the re reversal, it's taking a while. What needs to be done, as it's been done in some countries, like in, in Malaysia, in Latin America, is that you create a context where locals work with foreign partners, and they develop real skills, and they can compete in those areas, and they become the drivers of the economy, rather than decreeing ownership 
which then eventually prevents the kind of growth and development that you, you do want. So I, I think I will just uh, close it there, but there's so many lessons that we can learn from uh, our experiences that we can share. And thank you very much. Well done. Thank you, sir. Tuma, I'll let you respond to Sal's question, and then we'll invite probably three more. OK. I knew he was going to ask that question, because I know he's also passionate about developing our youth. But if you had followed my, my address, I did mention that we cannot be fully empowered without putting our leaders to give us the skills that we need to give us that critical awareness and most importantly opportunities and they all come in a package you cannot give me opportunity without getting me prepared what is opportunity if i don't have the skills to use them you cannot give me a, um, a land and say go and sow when that land is full of trash when that land is full of weeds you need to give me everything that it comes with as a package you cannot develop me and not give me opportunities to make good use of that development because otherwise I will just explode with frustrations. So it all comes in a package. That's why it is for the youth to understand what empowerment means. It is not, it is not just a word. It comes with everything that it takes. Thank you. I do not want to ask a question or say anything today, but there are two important things which I wanted to state. First is a statement, first a follow-up from what Sal just said. Tuma in his presentation said, um, spoke about youth empowerment, and uh, the moderator said, empowerment is not something you ask for, you take it. If you remember during the uh, parliamentary election campaigns. There was one of these um, party leaders and or one of the campaigners who were going around with us who said, um, he used to say this in Wolof, so that is what, in essence, what um, Alpha just said. Um, um, that's what I wanted to contribute to what you have said about empowerment. And uh, a lot of things have been said about youth empowerment. You need to take the empowerment yourself, empower yourself. Um, about Dambele, when the, I saw the name Dambele, it did not ring well because the trade name um, was not Dambele. Um, so I asked Imam, who is this Dambele? Is it Mansong? He said, yes, it's Mansong. That's how we know the name. Mansong, that was the trade name. Um, uh, I remember he changed the face of photography in this country because before then most of the photographs were in black and white. He started color after coloring. Yes, after that um, he brought this new idea of making a, uh, um, an album. We always used to give him contracts when we have occasions at the customs. He would come take the photographs, and after the event, he would come up with uh, an album, and uh, we buy the album, then all the members of staff will buy the, the ones that they have done. You have also taken this thing to another level. Le level. Uh, there was one thing too that um, um, uh, Museiru said about when in his presentation about, um, um, what was it again? It's about um, this um, question of the banks um, allowing um, their funds to go into business entrepreneurship instead of because of the interest rates um, have gone down, the treasury rates have gone down now that they will not have anywhere to put in their monies. They will have to give out um, loans to people with ideas. Um, I think um, that is actually evident because now that um, government is no longer borrowing from the central bank. Um, central bank will not be able to uh, take funds to, 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 to deliver to 
the banks will no longer take money into the central banks and buy treasury bills. So they will be forced to divert their money now into people with ideas who would use them as uh, uh, to, to develop their businesses. So those were the um, things I really wanted to speak on. Thank you. Mr. Hussein I largely agree with everything you said. And what's interesting is I know your son, Tafa, and we have similar disagreements to what I'm about to voice now. So I see where he gets it from. <laughs> uh, you talked about liberalizing uh, social security and uh, maybe increasing liquidity in the market. Uh, it, I mean, it's a good point. And uh, oftentimes it's seen as the remedy to um, when you have a lot of capital that is stagnant and so on. But I think uh, that is a very private sector focused approach to this particular problem. And I think it needs a wider sort of perspective. And when you look at social security and what it's done in the history of social security around the world and what it's been able to fund in terms of developmental projects, I think liberalizing it takes away from, what it, it takes away from its potential. And I think it can be a good source of development uh, finance for not just uh, you know, the priorities of the government, but civil society as a whole. So I think, um, you know, I realize Alpha Barry as well is from the, Mr. Alpha Barry is from the um, private sector as well. And you talked about the government getting out of the way. And this is something, this is discourse that we've seen in, you know, um, around whether the government is a force for good or needs to get out of the way. I would argue that the government is the primary um, source of development in terms of pushing development, in terms of uh, knowledge production, and in terms of devising policies that will bring development. And I think the private sector is there as potentially an engine of growth, but the private sector is just as liable sometimes when there's lack of growth. So I think, you know, a partnership between the two is what's needed instead of talking about, you know, getting out of the way. And I realize I'm talking to people who are infinitely more experienced than I am, but it's in the spirit of young people uh, saying what we think, I think that was important to point out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hussein, I'll let you respond to that before you say no. Yes. Uh, no, I, I, I entirely agree with you. But um, I think I come from a school where I think government's role in delivering social protection and basic services is fundamental to any economy to function effectively. However, the reason why I would advocate liberalizing uh, pension provision in a nation like ours, the only reason... Uh, and uh, permit me for saying Jame, the only even Jame targeted social security, somebody must have told him that they're investing a hundred million dollars in all the banks seeking for return and he targeted it. Now if you imagine if this was being managed by people who are more performance driven then it would deliver better but government has a recourse in that it will tax because the reason why there's a pro proliferation of revenue authorities in the continent is to leverage domestic resources. And the way you leverage domestic resources, at least in the case of the Gambia for the minute, is to broaden fiscal coverage and tax all over the place. And that is acting as a disincentive to many people, particularly small operators. So that's a question we need to address. And the best way to address it is to create greater liquidity. So that, I mean, in the social development goals, there's the language of leave no one behind. And I just want to share this example. We were in a conversation with the heads of states, and people wanted the language of eradicate poverty. And David Cameron, the then British Prime Minister, said, no, you eradicate extreme poverty. You don't eradicate poverty. And all of us in the room were infuriated because we're saying, why wouldn't you eradicate poverty? And he said, no, let me, let me respond. And he explained that for him in the UK, the guy who is a chambermaid or who is a restaurant waiter is relatively poor, but they can have a mortgage. They can have five square meals. They can go to school. He doesn't want to eliminate that. However, he wants to ensure that people have basic social protection, and that for him is extreme poverty. So it's, it's a very broad discussion. But believe me, if you release liquidity into a system, you force people to have ideas. You force initiative. You force creativity. And government has the power of legislating. So it can always come back in different ways, through fiscal policy, 
through environmental protection policy, through decentralizing government, local governments, and we're all experiencing it. Birkama Area Council is taxing us, KMC is taxing us, you know Banjo City Council is taxing us, and that is how government can generate revenue in a context where there is performance, there's wealth creation. And you also respond to inequality, because the biggest problem we have is inequality. If you look at the Arab Spring, what is happening in the West? Populism, to give us people like Trump, people like Marine Le Pen, extreme governments in Austria and other places. They're just tapping on people's sentiments. A very simple sentiment of, there are too many foreign people that I see, and people respond. Now, the way you stop that populism is you give people an interest in society. So that if I come and want to be a populist, people will say no. I mean, now, any military guy who turns up and organizes a coup and talks about corruption, I'm sure most of us here will riot and say, no, 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 we're having none of that. Because we have a lived experience. But you can prevent that lived experience by creating an enabling environment where people are aware and can confront issues. And that is critical. And for me, creating wealth by pushing resources into the wider economy. That's where I'm coming from. But I see your point around social protection and the need for basic services. Yes, it's a fair point. Good afternoon, and thank you very much. My question, my question was actually just partly answered, but I think it's a bit more directed to uh, Mr. Ngam. So over the past few days, I was actually quite elated to hear us speaking about sustainable development initiatives now, in theory, and for the knowledge, the knowledgeable, we know it's the only way forward. But it seems as though in practice, in terms of investment, there, there's quite a halt. So my question is um, directly, is it, what would make it more attractive? Is it more of a policy-based initiative, or does the private sector need to disrupt and take over on that forefront? I, I was uh, having a conversation with um, the few people who are sitting in the front. Part of the conversation during the development of the Sustainable Development Goals, there was a term, there were two terms that came about. The first term was disintermediation. In other words, don't be comfortable with what you do. Even doctors now, for example, are being disintermediated. Doctors who do consultancies only. People go and Google, I have a headache. You Google headache and you go give yourself <laughs> medication. So doctors are being disintermediated in that way. And there was also the language of co-convening and co-creation. And that is where I think there's a weakness. I think in all the processes where we were talking about resourcing sustainable development, I, in every session I went, Gambia government was represented. Now the question is, what were the report backs and the implementation plans? Did they come to those meetings inviting participants from a broader spectrum? That did not happen. And I was saying to Sal earlier that the Gambia most decided spirit must be broadened into a very well-governed structure so that, say for example, if, if we are asking for people to participate in a global discussion, we don't need to go through government. We can contact, you know, and, and a setup that exists that we know will represent. Because there's a lot of financing available for implementation. There's a lot of financing available for gender awareness. There's a lot of financing available for youth participation. But if you don't know it, if the letter lands at the Ministry of Finance and they minute it to the Deputy Permanent Secretary, it's never going to get to you. So that's a conversation now to have. I don't think the intention is to deny space. It's the fact that it's very normal for civil servants and bureaucrats to get into a routine of, you know, FYA for necessary action without thinking what action am I seeking? What result am I seeking? Now, that is where civic agency comes in, what we are doing now, to be able to confront some of those questions and say, look, if there is uh, equal partnership and there is funding for implementation, there is funding for awareness creation, who needs to be aware? It's your citizens. It's not your civil servants. Your citizens. How do you ensure that the money permeates to allow that awareness to happen? So, yes, the resources are there. The question is, how do we push to get those? I mean, recently there was a call from the EU for a livelihoods program in the Gambia. And I don't think any local NGO won it. I think it's won by big INGOs. In fact, I was stunned when I shared it with a few people. Very few people were aware that it was a Gambia-dedicated call. Mm -hmm. 
So that's what we need to change. And the mindset and behavioral change we are talking about is exactly about that. It needs to happen. And the print media and, uh, you know, uh, television media has a role in this, organizing programs. And I say this deliberately because Nyang is sitting in front. He is very fond of um, using those mediums. So push it more. It needs to happen. I want to thank everyone for your attention towards these important topics that people are discussing. Um, to me, I guess today, this is one of the greatest days that the young people of this country got. Because it's a moment where the environment is open for us. People are talking about change, change, change. Right, we need change. We need change in the positive way, not in the negative way. The attitudinal change needs to come first before we can change the system of this country. There should be something in the young people in the first place before they can make any change. What should be that? Who am I to know your value, you as a young, as a youth? I just, the Gambian young people, the youth of this country did not know, and still they don't know their value. I just, if they knew who they are, and the type of asset they are in a country, they will rather respect themselves more than they did now. Looking at all sectors, all areas, especially when you come into politics, I like talking about politics, especially because they fool people for their own personal interests. When my sister spoke, I could not wait to be given the opportunity to talk. I have to come up and stand and ask for, 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 for this opportunity to view out what is in me. If you look at it, all politicians, whenever they are preparing their policies or they are preparing their constitutions or whatsoever in their houses, before they come back to us, what they think first is the youth. How can I grab the mind of the youth? Then the headline of the news is very important because uh, newspapers are selling their, marketing their, their newspapers when they, were, when they are writing headlines, they give big name. So the politicians also give big name. What they do is uh, empowering youths and women. Knowing very well that it's youths and women that can empower you. You are not empowering them. <laughs> so here, then when we're talking about youth, I'm saying the government, the two, two decades that has gone, and the one we are in, I said, yet, I did not see any focus on youth development. Mm. Because we've been, we've been hearing the past budgets of the other decades. We saw the percentage that they give to youth development. This one also came. Still, if there is adjustment, it will like just uh, a... a small, small one that cost, uh, that add nothing to the value of the young people or the development of the young people. No, you don't thank me yet. Allow me to learn. Because this is a day of the young people. You've been giving all people talking. So this is our day. You call us. It's our day. You have to give us. So the young people, I am calling up the young people to avoid dependency. How can you become a personal defendant is try to achieve or get a knowledge, a knowledge that is sustainable, a sustainable knowledge. We have to get into skills. Young people have to get into skills to know who they are so that they can take care of themselves, take care of those behind them. In that case, none of us will be controlled by anyone. 
we will be controlling the government. If you say government, we are the government, but our central administration, that's the president and his cabinet, we are to control them. They should not control us. <laughs> By looking at the, them, uh, Madam, you said something that is very important, and if you say it, they say it's an opposition. That's not, that we should get out of that line now. We should get into a new model, new life, new development. If the president is going all the way to China, he comes, he is complaining of uh, what long journey. That's not the reason why we give our money. We give our tax money for him to go to China and come. And also, we are crying of, uh, uh, so we are crying of economic problem in our country. You can take up to 20 something people to take them up to America for a summit, spending millions. What did you bring back? To me, taking that money, give it to tough and others to invest in this country and give the young people the opportunity to do something, I think we better do that than giving them going anywhere, wasting our resources. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you very much. I am Aliuba. Um, I'm a writer and an activist and I just wanted to say two things. One for um, the private sector and another for um, the public sector. The private sector is, um, we, we talk about youth empowerment. It became this cliched phrase that doesn't really address the uh, fact of the matter. What is youth empowerment? When we, when we say these things, who define these terms? What are these terms? We talk about young people who have dreadlocks, for example, who drink attire and they don't do anything. How are we critically engaging them? How are we bringing them to the table? We talk about them, but they are not seen. They, can they speak for themselves? Can the subaltern speak, like another person would say? And the other thing is, I spearheaded a campaign here that most of you know about, the Occupy Westfield. And we wanted to speak truth to power. Young people in this country are not sleeping. It's not how many people, I heard a lot of people saying, oh, young people in this country don't want to do this. They don't want to be empowered. We want to be empowered. We have been doing this. We've been speaking truth to power. We've fought against Jame. We are fighting now and we will continue fighting. But we one of the biggest fight. impediments for youth empowerment in this country is the laws that have been put in place to keep us down, to silence divergence, to silence dissent. And I just want the honorable member to uh, tell us what has been done in regards to Section 5 of the Public Order Act that was used to kill Solo Sanding, that was used to jail Usainu Anko, that was used on us when we wanted to organize a protest against NAWEC. And they, the IGP used it on us to revoke our permit, to give us a permit, then deny it, then revoke it in the same vein. And nothing was said about this. Nothing was said about this. This became silenced, and I'm sorry if I am dragging too long, but I think it's very necessary that we are at the forefront. We are not silent. We are not, uh, we've not been quiet. We've been doing this. So when we talk about youth empowerment, we have to acknowledge that there are people doing it every day at the grassroots with people that are marginalized, that are pushed out and forgotten, and the government of the Gambia had to step up its game in removing bad laws that are impeding on our progress and our prosperity and our voice to dissent. Thank you. I mean, you've, you've asked your question, but I would want to wrap up. Probably you'll take that up one-on-one uh, -on -one with Tuma or the panel. Uh, I can... <laughs> okay. I, I told you that if you want power, you have to grab it. <laughs> okay. Okay. To, uh, please respond. I think I think I can just answer I think I can just answer that briefly. I mean thank you very much, Mr. Ba, for asking that question because I knew I applauded you when you went for Occupy Westfield. I am not an activist. I represent you and you have your representatives as National Assembly members. We, have, we represent the whole country. You can put your National Assembly member at task. We are at liberty to challenge any part of the Constitution. Recently, we fought ourselves. We removed the clause that would restrict us from acting independently. And you have a right to put, put us at task to make sure that we address 
that section of the constitution that limits your freedom because it is contradictory to different parts of the constitution one would say you are sovereign and the other one would say you don't have a right so which is which you have a right that my topic clearly states that you put us accountable make the government we are the government you voted us in so you are part of the government so go back there and put your national assembly member at task because that is why we were voted in you have a right to question us it's not my it's not my uh, immediate subject area but it's an area that i i work in so i thought i'll contribute mr ba uh, you'll be pleased to know that uh, immediately after the elections on the 2nd of December, you did a, a solo Facebook where you spoke for about one and a half hours, releasing as to the journey that you had made to get to the point where we were able to vote and vote out Jame. I remember sitting in Nairobi watching you for a full one and a half hours. And, a half hours. and uh, <laughs> I'm saying... And turning around to my wife and saying, you know, we spend a lot of money talking about empowerment, citizen engagement, and broader citizen activism. And look at this guy. I don't know whether he's, this is something that has happened by default, but not only has he done it, but he's taking his time to explain how it's made him feel and how the situation has evolved. Now, when you were doing the Occupy West Field, I personally followed. And I mm -hmm. felt Section 5 needs to be repealed to start with. Yeah. But I want to make a point as someone who works across the continent supporting activists and people who are involved in citizen engagement and sometimes smuggling people out of countries and helping them. When you are developing a theme for advocacy, it requires a lot of thought. I think one of the challenges you had was the term occupy. Because the term occupy is permanent. And the lack of leadership. And for most people who sit on the other side of receiving advocacy messages, particularly people who are reticent to criticism and a different view, their immediate reaction will be to clamp down. So that's what you need to reflect as a contribution. I personally wouldn't have used the term, hashtag Occupy Westfield. I would have said Light Gambia, for example, Light Up Gambia, or something like that. And I think, I commend you, I think... Uh, when I listened to you for one and a half hours, I was very impressed. I felt that Gambia has arrived. We're going somewhere. There are a lot of people in this country who are very talented, who are very skilled. But, you know, the same way, the same way you are bold enough to stand and take people to task, be prepared to have pushback. And sometimes the pushback is not because people don't want you to be an activist, but they want you to be subtle about messaging. It's critical. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I'll need to draw this uh, session to a close. And as I said, uh, we'll continue the discussions uh, afterwards. Please, uh, we seriously running out of time. Please, can you join me to thank the panelists? I think they've done a fantastic job. <laughs> <laughs>